Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to do these events, especially when we have such wonderful speakers. I am Baba Kepasade, CEO of Toronto Center and your moderator. Welcome to this timely uh, session on digital transformation in the financial industry, implications for financial stability, inclusion and supervision. Since our inception in 1998, Toronto Center has trained more than 15,000 central bankers and supervisors from 190 jurisdictions to build more stable, resilient, and inclusive financial system. This in turn supports sustainable economic development, helps to reduce poverty, and enhance gender equality. All citizens need access to safe and secure financial systems in order to save, make payments, borrow, and take out insurance especially in times of crisis and hardship. The pandemic has already widened the gap in access to financial services, especially for women. On the positive side, the pandemic has accelerated digitization of financial sector. The panel will discuss the challenges and benefits of digital money innovations and central bank digital currencies, as well as the development of electronic payments to serve the unbanked populations. Our distinguished panelists will also explore the impact of these developments on financial inclusion, stability, cross-border payment systems, especially in developing countries. Toronto Centre's mission is generously supported by Global Affairs Canada, Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, the IMF, Jersey Overseas Aid, Comic Relief, and the USAID. And at the outset, uh, we have to acknowledge that we're holding this uh, webinar still while the pandemic, uh, we're in the grips of it, and there's such an unequalness about it around the world. And I think the international community really must do more to provide more vaccines for everybody. I mean, we just need to move on and get this thing over. Before we start the panel, I would like to introduce our special guest to set the stage. It is my privilege and honor to introduce the Honorable Carolyn Levy. She's an elected official from the States of Jersey, Madame Levy was appointed as Jersey's first ever Minister for International Development and Chair of the Jersey Overseas Aid Commission in May 2018. She was also appointed as Assistant Chief, Chief Minister International and Chair of Executive Committee of the Jersey Branch of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. <clears throat> in addition, she has been very active on the education, sport, culture, citizenship, environment and economics portfolio. So Carolyn, what else is left? Uh, she has also been Jersey's representative on the British Islands and the Mediterranean Region Steering Committee for Commonwealth Women Parliamentary Association. She has a very, very big active portfolio. Before joining uh, the parliament, she also worked in the finance industry before entering politics. I had the pleasure of meeting Carolyn in Jersey in 2019 before travel restrictions were introduced. And I was very impressed with her passion for international development and programming, and sorry, prom promoting stable and inclusive financial systems. It is really my pleasure to welcome you, Carolyn. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Bobette. It gives me a great pleasure to open this meeting today. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Toronto Center for bringing us all together. We're here because we believe that use of and access to financial services is crucial in driving global development. The benefits of financial inclusion are hard to overstate. As we all know, there are roughly 1.7 billion people around the world who are unbanked and do not have access to financial services. This means that they cannot easily save for their children's education take out a loan to buy seeds and fertilizers, or buy insurance to protect them from medical or natural disasters. Microfinance plays a key role in international economic development. It is a powerful instrument and empowers those that are traditionally marginalized and is a sphere reliant on and daily strengthened by digital innovation. The rapid growth and adoption of digital services poses challenges to financial stability, which we will discuss later today. The COVID-19 pandemic 
touched our lives in many different ways. And adopting new technology became vital in order to maintain social connections, provide educational needs and sustain economies worldwide. The crisis also served to highlight and heighten existing financial, digital and social divides across all jurisdictions. The need for dependable access to financial services and how this access aids the management of financial emergencies has never been clearer. In common with most forms of adversity, it has been in poorer nations without the healthcare access to financial support and social safety nets that many of us rely on, that the impact has been most severe. In 2020, the number of people living in absolute poverty rose for the first time since 1997. And as you will know, the World Bank estimates that in 2021, an additional 150 million people will live below the poverty line because of COVID-19. Jersey looks to add value to the field of financial inclusion through our significant access to knowledge and, and capital in addition to our ODA. And as one of the best regulated financial centres in the world, we particularly appreciate the importance of high quality financial supervision. Jersey Overseas Aid's financial inclusion programme targets poor and marginalised groups with a particular focus on empowering women and on improving the efficiency and profitability of agricultural value chains. We're delighted to support the work of the Toronto Centre, which has widened financial inclusion and improved regulatory oversight globally with its reach. Having trained 15,000 regulators and supervisors from over 190 countries since its first programme, including many from Jersey. It recognises that equitable access to financial services is important for the world over. Events such as this provide an important platform for sharing knowledge and forming creative partnerships. Organisations on all sides benefit from this dialogue. The shared experience of recent years has highlighted at once the need for further technological advancement in public, private, philanthropic and development finance centres and that universal access is within reach. Once more, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today and to Toronto Centre for facilitating this discussion. I am truly honoured to introduce the distinguished panel, and I look forward to witnessing the developments this forum brings. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, those were very insightful remarks. I think they set the stage very well for this discussion. And thank you so much to you and the Jersey Overseas Aid for championing international development and the nice plugs about Toronto Center. Very much appreciate it. Now it is my pleasure to welcome our distinguished panelists who are notable international authorities on this topic, as well as being international influencers. Uh, there are no strangers to this community. I'm not gonna be reading their bios. You have seen their bios, uh, we've distributed them to you, but I will draw on their experiences as I ask some questions. It's my honor to introduce you to you to Dr. Patrick Njoroge, uh, a good friend and governor of Central Bank of Kenya and uh, Patrick, congratulations on the 50th anniversary of the Central Bank of Kenya and the launch of your book, uh, which is very important. I had the pleasure of attending uh, the, the video ceremony yesterday, the virtual ceremony. Um, John Rowe is the governor of Central Bank of Bahamas, and we have a lot of interest to hear from you about your e-money experience. Socorro Heisen is a member of Toronto Center's board of directors, and when she's not our board member, she also acts as the superintendent of banks, insurance, 
pension fund administrators of Peru. So Socorro, you're very busy. Eshwar Prasad, we were very honored to have him as our first time guest, is a Nandlal uh, P. Tolani Senior Professor of Trade Policy at the prestigious Cornell University and Senior Fellow of Brookings Institution and an author of a noted book, which I will reference uh, during this discussion. So there'll be two rounds. Uh, I'll try to stop depending on the number of questions I receive and I encourage you to please submit your questions. Don't be shy. Let's work this panel. And we will, uh, I will take a break uh, so that we can answer your questions. Then we move to the round two and we go from here. So without further ado, let's start. Um, Eshwar, I was wondering if I can pose my very first question to you. You're the only non-regulator on this panel. Don't worry, we won't hold it against you. And as a noted academic, you have had the chance to reflect on these issues from a broader perspective. Uh, most of us are just in the thick of the battle. In your latest book titled, The Future of Money, How Digital Revolution is Transforming Currencies and Finance, you detail how accelerating financial change, such as the rise of cryptocurrencies, will transform economies for better or for worse. I'm really interested to learn more, but I will ask you to please keep your comment to about four to five minutes so we can circulate the panel. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Thanks to you, Babak, and your colleagues for organizing this panel and for having me um, along with such distinguished uh, colleagues to talk about these important issues. Financial innovation, of course, is nothing new, but I think we are at the threshold of a really dramatic transformation in the nature of financial markets and institutions and in the very nature of financial intermediation. And this is going to have um, a lot of uh, benefits as our lead speaker already pointed out. Um, the new technologies provide any avenues for financial inclusion um, that is going to bring a lot of benefits, especially to low income households, to small scale entrepreneurs with these effects being particularly important for low income and developing economies uh, but even in an advanced economy such as the United States, where about 5% of the adult population is still unbanked or underbanked, there are many benefits to be had. I think access to low cost digital payments is going to be a boon for consumers and businesses. And the new technologies, I think, are going to also make it um, more easy to get over the many frictions and impediments that now uh, bedevil international payments in particular. Um, and as um, we all know, international trade, uh, plus the sort of um, uh, remittances that economic migrants send back to their home countries are quite important in terms of international capital flows, again, especially for um, low income and developing countries. Now, of course, um, a lot of this revolution was underway even before uh, Bitcoin emerged on the stage, but the uh, emergence of cryptocurrencies is certainly given a boost um, to these um, developments uh, that I think are going to lead to more direct forms of financial intermediation that connect savers and borrowers, that provide easy access uh, to financial instruments, make it much easier for new entrants um, to join the financial system. So all of this is a positive. Now, of course, there is a great um, uh, deal of discussion about whether Bitcoin and other decentralized cryptocurrencies are in themselves going to be transformative. My own view is that Bitcoin, of course, as um, a medium of exchange is not going to work very well. It has fundamental flaws, uh, including its unstable value, the fact that it has a very low um, uh, transaction volume that can be processed on the network um, and a variety of other flaws. Certainly other cryptocurrencies are coming along that try to fix these flaws, stable coins, for instance, that try to provide stable value um, and thereby provide more efficient digital payments by essentially being backed up by stores of fiat currencies. And there's an interesting irony there because cryptocurrencies, after all, were supposed to um, get us away from government managed payment systems. But in fact, they seem to be getting their legitimacy from um, the backing by fiat currencies. My view, however, is that the real legacy of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies is going to be the blockchain technology, which by providing the building blocks for decentralized finance, I think will make a much broader range of products and services in addition to low cost digital payments widely available. But there are risks as well. Um, I think there are fundamental divides in our societies, especially unequal digital access, the lack of financial literacy, 
that could lead to existing problems being exacerbated by these new technologies. In addition, I think the new technologies are going to lead to substantial changes in financial intermediation, including possibly challenging the structure of traditional commercial banks. And of course, commercial banks are crucial in terms of the creation of money in modern economies. Um, they are very important in terms of the transmission um, of monetary policy. So if you look around to the challenges that central banks face, both the implementation of transmission and monetary policy are going to face very significant challenges. In addition, I think there is going to be um, an aspect of low-income developing countries and small open economies being challenged. This is an existentially challenging moment um, for some of these economies where I can well conceive of digital versions of major currencies such as the dollar or the Chinese renminbi, or perhaps even stable coins backed up by corporations such as Facebook um, that really challenge these currencies. So I think we are at a stage where there are many benefits to be had at the country level, at the level of individual households and businesses. But I think we have to be very cognizant of the risks this poses in terms of monetary policy in individual economies, in terms of the monetary sovereignty indeed um, of certain economies and the possibility that these technologies might rather than um, bridging, uh, might end up exacerbating the existing divides in our societies. That's actually, thank you, uh, Dr. Prasad. That's actually really good because one of the things that you highlighted or a subtext that I'm hearing from you is not, it's not an easy transition. It's not an easy thing to talk about. We're going to deal with it today. And there's regulatory issues. There's all kinds of various issues to, to grapple with. But the elephant in the room is the consumer, right? The consumer is not happy with their big traditional financial institutions. And there's a chipping away happening. And now we're finding this and fintech and everything else. And what does this central banker to do, right? So those are really at the nub of these things. So let's just move on to Governor Roll. It's a pleasure to have you, sir. And I noticed you went to University of Western Ontario. That's where my niece and nephew are studying right now. So good for that for you. You're the champion of uh, e-currency race. Bahamas became a global leader in e-money last year when it launched one of the world's first uh, central bank digital currencies, the sand dollar. You have been working on central bank digital currencies since at least 2016. What have you learned so far from your pioneering role and what have been the biggest obstacles to your efforts? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Babak. And let me also thank the Toronto Center for hosting this event. Uh, I, I will clarify that we conceived of a central bank digital currency probably around about 2018, but it encapsulated into a longer process of payment system modernization where the push towards recognizing the kinds of system we needed for electronic payments uh, materialized around about 2012. And in the space between then and the present, we, we also anticipated that there would need to be new players in the space. To, to get the electronic money uh, uh, use uh, started. And so we, we, we focus in that period on addressing consumer protection issues, how to have regulations for these providers and recognizing very early in that process that these new providers would still need to confront interoperability issues. And hence uh, we, we, we thought and advance to the stage of recognizing the, the value that a central bank digital currency could have in providing the interoperability for the space. So it's, a, it's a, a case where coming later to the game in terms of mobile money and electronic payment, you were able to immediately leapfrog and, and use uh, the developing uh, ideas around CBDC to make certain that the new players in the space could, could be fully interoperable. What is important to recognize though is that in, in many cases, in many sense, the, the Bahamas is still at an infancy stage in terms of its population using mobile money. Digital finance is pervasive, but not so much mobile money. And that helps to define some of the, the lessons and challenges we've had in getting to this point, because it's still a project. You know, one of the important lessons when you're looking at a country 
where you don't have that depth yet of experience in using the mobile products. In, so with the smartphone being the delivery channel is that this is not an organic process for us at the beginning. We have to put the effort into pushing this forward. Um, we, we recognize, for example, that this fits into our push for a more resilient uh, country from an archipelago standpoint, how we address financial inclusion. And so pushing for CBDC adoption in the scattered archipelago is very important to address uh, underbank and unbank uh, parts of our community. One of the things that our adoption process that we recognize and learn is important is that public education is necessary, not specifically on central bank digital currencies, but in getting the public to become more confident and skilled around using digital payment tools in a secure fashion. And so there's a lot of education around the, the technology, the security of the technology and how individuals can operate in a secure fashion. We also have to focus at this early stage on building up the critical mass of merchants. People need outlets to spend uh, mobile money. And in many cases, we're looking at extending the reach from a financial inclusion point to micro and small businesses that may not yet be as active with the smart cards and other uses uh, that, that allow for electronic payments. Now, as a payment instrument, in an otherwise mature financial system, we also recognize that those who are potential users of a CBDC do not view it as a substitute for banking system and products. So we, we've learned very early in this process that we must have the integration with the traditional banking system. And so one of the, the, the current focuses of our work is completing that connection with the automated clearing house so that users can, can have that connectivity, particularly where they're already uh, nestled in the banking system. The public sector is incredibly important and they have to be visible in this process. And one of the, the visibilities for the government is just getting us through the establishment of the legal framework. But the government is also in the case of the Bahamas in the very early stages of shifting to digital platform for services delivery. And because they're integrating uh, the sand dollar into their payments options, that's going to be a very important push and, and a show of leadership in terms of how we get the, the country moving along in, in, in adopting digital. And it also speaks to the financial inclusion aspect because government services need to be accessible, even at the payments level to all stratas of society. In the adoption process, we also have to focus and appreciate the importance of the coordination with the financial institutions because the model is not one where the central bank is on the front line distributing a CBDC. We have to rely on those institutions. And so there's an element of patience and allowing them to get up to speed, developing their product platforms, et cetera. If you had to talk about obstacles in a project mode, yes, there will always be project related uh, issues that you have to deal with. And, but I would say that the, the greatest obstacle in introducing such a revolutionary change has been the pandemic, because even though this is taking the country more in the digital direction, you're dealing also with segments of the population for which digital payments will be something that they have to get more accustomed to. And so there is an element of in-person interaction that we've been missing up until this point and we are now in a better position to push ahead with those kinds of inter interaction. And, and that is really going to help us in terms of the way we, we move forward with, 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 with the adoption process. Uh, I'll stop there and I'll, I'll wait uh, for, the, for the next round if anything else comes up. Thank you, Governor. I just want to connect something. I heard a theme or a con connective tissue between your comments and Ishwar's in a sense that he at some point mentioned the fact that, that it's ironic that cryptocurrency and these things were developed to, to sort of decentralize and now the governments are stepping in. But in a way, as I'm listening to you, I think there might be some wisdom to government stepping in, not a wholehearted endorsement of that, but the fact that if nothing else, you're introducing some degree of competition. We've seen it in elsewhere as well. As disruptive technologies have come to deal with ride sharing or whatever, the traditional players in that sector, taxis or whatever, they they up their game, right? So that might be a very 
elementary type of an example to try to connect to, but it talks about the, the complexity of this, again, going back to the consumer, right? So now I want to turn my attention to Africa and uh, Dr. Njiroge, Patrick, again, congratulations on your book. And, uh, you know, it's interesting as you listen to this, uh, I think you probably find it a bit ironic as well, because Kenya is a success story by almost any metric in digital finance journey. And I think is a honor well-deserved. I'm sure it wasn't easy and uh, goes uh, way back, which probably helps some of the battles that you experienced with the pandemic. So as you reflect on that in this conversation, um, in your view, what were the pillars that have anchored your financial transformation journey and are there any lessons for us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Barbara, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, thank you, Barbara, for joining us yesterday for the book launch. Um, that was good. Um, but in terms of your question, I think, uh, oh, I should also say that I really appreciated what Ezra and uh, my brother John um, explained just now about their, their respective journeys that they described. From our perspective, um, looking back, obviously the whole process of payments, uh, transforming payments, um, is to be uh, is to be seen in the context of the history of the country, but obviously the milestone, the real milestone, or the significant milestone was in 2007, and this is when M-Pesa was put in place, in effect, uh, being the start of a digital money revolution. But I think there are several elements that, uh, at that point, we should say. Um, the, the level of financial inclusion was uh, 26%. Today, um, well, actually two years ago in 2019, it was already at 83%. And uh, we are doing a survey now. Um, it's about to be concluded and I'm pretty sure it will be north of 90%. Um, but now I'm not sure, I'm not so sure, you know, maybe I'm not as positive as I was a little earlier because of the impact of the pandemic. We, could have gone either way because of that. But nevertheless, it has really transformed the landscape. Um, and I think there are specific elements uh, that led to that. First is that there was a clarity about the problem. And I think this is something which anyone, um, even in the discussions that just now, you know, John was talking about, he, he's clear about what problem they're trying to solve. For us, the problem was sending money uh, from the um, urban areas, meaning the workers that are in the urban areas to their rural homes. And, uh, and that is really what drove this transformation in terms of digital money. And uh, of course there has been other technologies before that, uh, but they never really worked as much as this one. So I think that is important. Of course, there was the underlying it, there was the, the the sort of um, penetration of uh, the digital technologies, meaning the forms. And therefore that was, a, an it, the technology was accessible. It wasn't like you needed to go to some uh, shop or office or whatever else it is that is 20 kilometers away, etc. That I think is one. So it is important to emphasize that it was people centric and everything we've done since then we have come back to this point. What problem are you solving? And are you really dealing with people? You see, I say that because there's also a problem nowadays as we have been, uh, I mean, we're in the mix of all this and there's more excitement about technology. Um, so, but our question is always, okay, what problem are you solving? And how are you going to help the people move forward in terms of bringing them, um, in, uh, lift their, um, their livelihood, et cetera, as the minister mentioned a moment ago. That's one element. The second one was uh, the regulatory principle that we had. Um, our view here is to, we have an objective to minimize um, the risks that are there. And as regulators, um, we are always concerned about financial stability. So even though the solution that is being brought to us looks really nice. 
in terms of technology or it has a whiz, whiz bang, you know, front end, whatever. We go back to the first question, which is, okay, tell us about financial stability. Um, what are the risks that you're bringing in? How are you mitigating them, et cetera? And there's a whole host of issues that one could discuss. Now we, we talk a lot more about um, cybersecurity, et cetera. But I think all that has to be seen in terms of mitigating the risk. And so from our perspective, therefore, we did not wait until we had a perfect solution. And there was a test and learn approach that we adopted as regulators. I think nowadays they call it a sandbox kind of thing. So there, we were doing sandboxing before the term sandboxing was invented. And, uh, and I think this really helped. Um, of course, the understanding was if there were, if the risks became too much, uh, we just pulled the thing from the wall, you know, you just turn it off kind of thing. So um, then finally, I think it is important to appreciate that uh, there, there, there was potential um, of improving, let's say, lift, going beyond just the payments. Um, and I'm talking, maybe I, I put it out as an example. The, 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 um, the digital money sort of uh, MPESA, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, experience and all that. What it also did is to actually improve the welfare of people. In fact, there has been studies done about the impact on growth, et cetera, and impact on uh, health of families and uh, women, et cetera. So there was that other end. So you could say that those are byproducts. Now, as economists, actually, that is why we do business. So they are not byproducts, really. Um, that is really what we, we do. But I think what then also happened is we got an ecosystem that actually grew around it, around these uh, platforms um, that, uh, and I think in a sense, the sky was the limit. So there are many other elements that, uh, for instance, you know, micro borrow, micro loans, um, micro insurance, nano insurance, um, health apps, et cetera, farming apps, all of which have, uh, have uh, kind of grown around this ecosystem. So to me, those are the elements that uh, I would probably flag as uh, critical in our success. You had also asked uh, something about the, the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the pandemic or did no, I, I just, mishear you? No, I think, I think you answered it uh, very well. I was just thinking what were the pillars that have anchored your financial transformation journey. And I think you expressed that really. Okay. Well. And Patrick, I want to thank you because I remember back in 2016, we had a panel in Washington and you attended and you were trying to provide the, because back then these ideas were fairly uh, uh, new. You were trying to provide a real life answer and you gave a very interesting example. I'm just going to take 10 seconds to talk about it, which was you said, you know, conceive of this woman who has two kids, lives in a hut, uh, lives by a coastal area and gets up three in the morning and uh, orders the fish from the fishermen who are out there in the water at 3 a.m. and then puts her kids, takes her, you know, wakes up a little bit later, takes her kids to school and all that, goes back to the market at around 6 a.m. and picks up the fish. And right there, all of that happened through that electronic form. And then, but then where do the regulators come in? I think that was a very interesting picture that helped organize a lot of our thinking, right? Because really brought it down to the ground. So thank you for that. Wanted to thank you after five years, seven years about that. Okay, so Coro, <laughs> that's good. Let's come to you now. You, you, you tell it well, Babak. I like that. You <laughs> you tell it in ten seconds. I would have taken three hours. So good for that. Thank you. Thank you. I missed a lot though in that ten seconds. So Coro, over to you. Peru is a very uh, important emerging economy in um, Latin America, and you have uh, you know you really are dealing with a lot of these issues from supervisory perspective. So your co-panelists offered their interesting insights as the lead banking, insurance, and pension sector supervisor. You have a unique perspective on the challenges of emerging economies. We're interested to know about how digital transformation is affecting Peru's financial sector. What has gone well and one not so well? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bavak. Uh, it's as usual, 
it is a pleasure to me to be part of this uh, interesting discussions and with such an outstanding uh, group of experts. Um, as in many countries, uh, uh, Peru uh, was uh, had a process of digital transformation that was accelerated with COVID-19. And uh, many institutions that went, had uh, well planned efforts, just follow them faster. And institutions that were lagging behind were forced to follow that path also. So these circumstances of the pandemic demanded more digital services, more digital products, more digital channels of communication. And I think financial institutions in Peru have responded well to this demand. And I can give you a few examples to, to illustrate this. Um, we at the SBS uh, have a collect regularly information of the new products that are being developed by financial institutions and the, and the important changes that are taking place. So when we have a statistic, a monthly statistic of, of these uh, new products and important changes, and this number of new products and important changes has been growing regularly over the years. But uh, what strikes me as um, noticeable is that during the pandemic, if we compare, for, for instance, 2018 figures with 2020 figures, in 2018, in the whole financial services industry, we had 121 new products and significant changes. Whereas in 2020, we had 315 of those. And most of these uh, initiatives have uh, a technology or a digital element uh, to it. And they are associated with issues such as as broad as uh, digital onboarding in banking and insurance or, or online credit from start to finish or digital foreign exchange transactions. Or for instance, uh, one of the important changes has been intraday 24 hours mobile transfers among clients of different financial institutions uh, has increased 13 fold from 2019 to 2021. Uh, so before most of these transactions were delayed, uh, 24 hours uh, delayed transactions. Now they are intraday transactions and, and, and that is the most dominant way of transferring money in Peru. So that, that is a very, very interesting development. Um, so the trend uh, or towards digitalization of the financial system uh, has, has, has grown and, and has taken over uh, as, as the main way or the main channel uh, of, of, of transactions for people. And many of these uh, initiatives are individual efforts of individual financial entities, but some of these are not necessarily uh, collaborations and alliances among financial, industry, uh, finan financial entities and also between financial entities and startups. And for instance, I want to mention that uh, uh, we have uh, three key uh, digital payment alliances in, going on in Peru. Or, Yape that has nine entities, uh, Plin that has five entities, and Beam that has 26 entities. So all these uh, alliances are, are allowing people from far away, rural areas, uh, poor neighborhoods to have access to transfers through their uh, mobile phones. So all these are good news. It means that our legal framework, our regulatory framework has been flexible enough to allow this uh, massive innovation surge but uh, as you know, all these did not come uh, free of effort. Uh, uh, we as in SBF has, have uh, enough regulatory powers to, to regulate most of these issues. And we have been continuously working on updating our regulation. And we have issued new regulation or updated regulation on uh, information security, business continuity, cybersecurity, cloud computing, uh, risk related to outsources and service providers, sandboxes, guidelines for exchanging information through application programming interfaces, and market conduct. So uh, all these uh, new regulations are creating a, a, a framework uh, for 
digital transformation to take place in an efficient and safe way. Because as you know, as financial regulator, our main concern is that transformation, digital transformation process is carried out safely. And by safely, I mean safely in three different senses. Uh, safely in terms of financial stability, safely in terms of, of safely for the consumer uh, to ensure that entities take uh, adequate precautions to mitigate the risks for the consumers, uh, and safely in terms of the integrity of the financial system in terms of preventing money laundering and, and other crimes. So many of the regulations that I have uh, mentioned are to be implemented gradually as they require significant adjustments from the part of the industry, but and others require that the industry understand them and, and rely on them to, to, to use them in their own projects like sandboxes, for instance. So, but overall, I think they, this regulation, regulatory framework uh, provides a good balance to allow innovation with the safety considerations for stability, market conduct, and integrity. So these are our main drivers uh, of our regulation, but of, as you know, uh, all these poses huge, huge challenges for us uh, regulators for, and the industry and the country. Uh, because this is not uh, uh, the effort of one one entity or one 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 government authority. It's it's a, it's a common effort, and keeping up with innovation is a huge huge challenge for any government. And uh, and in 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 that sense, um, human capital is a scarce resource, because we are all, all competing with the same specialized resource that is knowledgeable about all these new technological issues. And we are not competing locally. We are not competing only with the financial industry. We're competing globally now that uh, remote work has made labor markets global. So that is, that is a big challenge for us. Uh, a second challenge is that our financial industry is heterogeneous. And this uh, creates digital transformation um, to be also uneven among different industries. And so they are laggards and they are leaders. And in this context, large incumbents have a lot of advantages in terms of scale, of scope, of network and, and of information effects that may lead us to uh, aggravate an, uh, a problem of concentration in an already highly concentrated financial services industry. And uh, although as a financial regulator, we do not have a mandate for competition, we as SBS do share the concerns of other authorities about the, the increase in, in concentration that is also a byproduct of digital transformation. Uh, that's, an, uh, that's another thing. Other, we have Peru, and Peru has challenges in terms of geography, uh, financial literacy, uh, um, uh, infrastructure as many emerging countries and all these require uh, uh, a huge strategy. That we're, I'm gonna talk about that probably later in, another, in a different question. <laughs> and, and, and in SBS, we already have our own challenge because we are dealing with our own digital transformation in terms of applying uh, technology to supervisory processes for market conduct, for uh, anti-money laundering and for other things. So all this makes it a very, very interesting time to be working at a financial regulator. So, and I am not mentioning the international challenges because that is a huge thing. There are many of the issues we are dealing with that are uncharted territory, not only for an emerging market, but Peru, but for all authorities, we, we don't know how to deal with big techs, we don't know what is the scope for open banking. I mean, there is a number of things that are unresolved at an at international level. So thanks, uh, thanks. No, it, is, it is very interesting. It is interesting. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to scare us too much with all the challenges <laughs> right away. It's still a little bit early in some jurisdictions. But, uh, you know, as a supervisor, you have a very tough job. I always, you know, think about that, because you don't get to set those policies, you don't get to set the, the decisions, but you have to enforce them. When things go wrong, it is your role. And you said something very interesting at the very end. 
you're mentioning how you have your own digital transformation challenge at the supervisory institution. So it kind of reminds me, doesn't it remind you a little bit of, uh, you know, the air, air, airlines, they say in case of emergency, put your own mask on first and then the person next to you. you know, so you kind of have to do that. So we have a couple of good questions from the audience. Let me see if we can answer them and then go to the next round. Um, Governor Roll, I'm going to uh, come to you for the first part of this question and Governor um, in Jiroga for the last part of the question from Lungele. So we have a massive uh, number of different cryptocurrencies, Governor Roll, tokens, e-currencies, et cetera. How do we create a synergy between different consumers if there's such an immense complexity and availability of digital currencies? Thank you. That, that, that's an excellent question. And it, it gets at uh, the issue of regulation, as well as it gets, I think, at how we distinguish between how these various cryptocurrencies are being used. In the central bank digital currency space, our emphasis is on payments. And so making sure that we have something that's reliable for payments as opposed to uh, an instrument that is serving both a payments need as well as a speculative uses, which, which, which complicate some of the concerns that consumers might have. But at the same time, I think this question is bringing out that if we are using these instruments for payment, just like fiat currencies, there has to be a market for the exchange. And in the digital space, I, I think it again highlights that the issue of interoperability goes beyond just the domestic financial systems. And, and we will have to look at how in a regulated fashion, you, you can determine the standards by which uh, instruments can, can tap into an interoperable network. That is one of the ways that, that one has to deal with this. Security is an issue, and there are two elements of security, but the one I think that we have to focus on, aside from just the, the infrastructure and the hardware, is really the end users. And that is a big part of the emphasis in the Bahamas, as I'm sure it is in other countries where you're trying to get the population to migrate to greater use of digital technology. So focusing on the user as one of the first lines of defense around security is important. As the first issue, as I said, we have to look at how we regulate the access because in our space, you know, the emphasis is really on the consumer protection issues. And, and that has to be addressed as well in the crypto asset space. Thank you. And Governor Njiroga, uh, Governor Rule uh, uh, addressed some of those securities issues, but do you also have any views on how do we ensure the security of this digital financial world, given that you had a bit of an early mover uh, lead in this in your own country? Like, uh, what, has, what do you think about this question? <clears throat> Thank you, Bobak. Um, I think first, uh, I would say there are several levels that one can look at or uh, several ways of looking at uh, the question or the answer to the question. And I think first is you do need to have what I'll call basic, um, let's say, principles or rules about how data is transmitted, how data is saved, um, and who has what access. And I think now, when we started off, we didn't have GDPR. Nowadays, I'm talking of those rules that explain who should, uh, who should, how we should keep data in particular ways. Um, so I think that there is a sort of underlying sort of uh, set of questions that need to be dealt with. That is one. Secondly, uh, I think as you move into the various uh, products, you begin to get their, they begin to have their own, let's say, specific questions. And I think the, the issues that uh, Estor just now um, or earlier talked about, the Bitcoins, et cetera, we know that at the beginning, these were being used for, um, you know, to support illicit transactions, illicit payments and things like that. And, uh, and I think um, we as regulators, um, we were very clear that we cannot support that in any way. Um, it goes against the principles of uh, proper, properly functioning uh, um, economies, etc. So I think the point I'm making here is that you do need to look at the specifics that are there as well. 
I'm sure on the things like AML, CFT, anti-money laundering, those, those need to be crafted to be improved as uh, to keep up with the, uh, with the technologies that are there. But I think on the whole, um, it's a, um, let's say it's a, it's a, it's a, moving, uh, it's a moving target. Uh, we need to be ahead of uh, those that are working against us, but it's a moving target. Yeah. So in another web saying, take the war to the, to those cyber criminals, right? Okay. So yeah. coming to, uh, uh, Ishwar, I was wondering if I can ask you a question. I mean, I've noticed your role at the IMF and other stuff that you have thought about is uh, one of the main advantages of fiat currency is that the supply can be increased at any point to meet the demand of the economy. How it will be the case of digital currency? I mean, we all read about how Bitcoin has a limited number, this and that. Most of us are not that sophisticated. How would you answer this question? So one of the fundamental um, articles of faith among Bitcoin adherents seems to be that it is the limited supply of that currency that maintains its value. And this is a curious proposition for an economist, because if you think about what gives a currency value, it has to have some intrinsic use. And Bitcoin was supposed to be an effective medium of exchange, a decentralized one that you could use with just your digital identities. It's not served very well in that function. Um, so it doesn't have intrinsic value. But the notion that ultimately there can be only 21 million Bitcoins, about 18 and a half million have been mined so far. Relative to a fiat currency that can be supplied at will by the central bank seems to be the key determinant of Bitcoin's value. To me, that is a dubious proposition, and it seems to me that it's built on a very fragile foundation of faith. Uh, the reality that we face, although it is a somewhat um, um, ironic one again, is that it is the ability of fiat currencies uh, to be produced in quantities that can support financial markets when there are times when um, liquidity infusions are needed is what gives them value because we know that in a time of crunch, the central bank can provide that money, which is what gives that money value. But that too is a slightly shaky foundation if uh, central banks misuse that power. Um, so I think the uh, importance of central bankers, um, such as Governor Njoroge and Governor Roll, um, uh, maintaining their roles as the guardians of that faith is really important. But ultimately, I don't see um, Bitcoin and other decentralized cryptocurrencies are seriously challenging um, uh, central bank issued currencies as stores of value. And even as mediums of exchange, once you have CBDCs um, proliferate and if they are provided in an efficient, low cost manner and in a manner that reaches a lot of people, I think the user case for a lot of cryptocurrencies, including stable coins, will uh, disappear as well. Thank you. And Governor Roll, do you have any views on this question yourself? I mean, I just wanted to give you maybe a central banker a chance to comment on this. You probably dealt with this yourself, right, in your thinking? Yeah. Well, very simple. We should not use the invention of CBDCs to redefine the role of fiat money. And I think if we stick to that, uh, these issues uh, should not present any new questions beyond the way we handle uh, expansion or slowdown in monetary uh, aggregate uh, evolution. So that, that, I think, is the most important thing, because if this is just a substitute for the paper cash or the format in which banks hold reserves, uh, we have to be careful in terms of how we try to, to, to assign other uses, because then it will add complexity beyond the way we perceive of C uh, fiat currency. Good. So keep it simple, stay to the basics, keep the fiduciary responsibility in mind. Thank you. So the last round, we talked about digital revolution opportunities and challenges ahead. Now let's go to the next round, talk about what's next. I'm going to start with you again, Governor Roll. What is next for the Central Bank of Bahamas strategy regarding digital platforms, payment systems, and the new payment services providers? Thank you. Unfortunately, we are a very small economy, 400,000 people. So it's, it's a difficult market to operate inefficiently. So I do not see a future where there is a, a large proliferation of payment providers. I anticipate that our commercial banks and others who are, who are not yet as far along in the CBDC participation, that they will, they will become fully integrated and we're and we gonna purposely push that. What I think 
is going to be important is an instrument such as a CBDC interoperability and how it extends the reach or the channels through which services can be provided or intermediated, that it if it if it works successfully, it fades into the background. We do not think about it, but financial intermediation on the whole is able to improve because of the inefficiencies in which uh, transactions are able to settle. That, that, I think, is very important in terms of how we um, vision the, the future. And also, we want to allow the services providers the space to innovate and think about how they uh, refine the customer experience when we move beyond the basic level of sending and receiving monies. Because now uh, the creativity will come in around how people manage and account for you know, their, their transactions, which is no different from the experiences that we might have at credit cards and other instruments that are already quite proliferate. So that's important. In addition to that, it's already been touched upon. We are going to have to put a lot of attention in the near term on the consumer protection issues around data and privacy. And interestingly, if this is just the other version of cash, then it has to function like cash in the sense that all persons have access to it, including children and minors. And therefore, from that point of view, those data protection issues become very critical. And, and, and we've already flagged that as an area where in, in, the, in the case of the Bahamas, uh, we're gonna be very attentive as, as we focus on, on bringing uh, the financial inclusion reach particularly to the younger persons in the society. Thank you very much. Um, going to, uh, let's carry on with uh, Socorro here. Digital transformation is bringing benefits, including for financial inclusion. The government touched on some of that through digital payments and deposit accounts. How is this making a difference in improving access to financial services, especially for the poor in rural and remote areas in Peru? How about others in Latin America? And really the, the question, I know it is a little bit rhetorical, but this is, there's a truth in that too, in a sense that, that this was the promise of these digital, uh, you know, digital finance to get to the remote and rural areas. So is it working? I guess that's the, that's the way, that's one way of looking at it. I think it is working, but it, it is not gonna work on its own. Um... It, it needs a, a comprehensive strategy. And, and let me give you a, 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 few, a few examples. Uh, we have seen in one year in Peru, the, the percentage of population using deposit accounts has increased from 43% in the middle of 2020 to 52% in the middle of 2021. So nine points in one year is a huge, huge improvement in terms of deposit use. Um, but our numbers are clearly not as impressive as those in Kenya, and they underline that we have a lot of work to do. Um, at, at the same time, for instance, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have a, a several digital plat uh, wallets and, and payment platforms that are being used a lot. And uh, out of the 12 and a half million people in Peru, adult, adult uh, people in Peru, uh, seven, of, seven million of those are using Yape, which is one of the uh, digital wallets. Uh, Four million are using uh, uh, Plim, and one and a half million are using Bean. Of course, many of them are using two or three of these platforms at the same time because they are not entirely interoperable yet. But that, that is a huge, a huge improvement. Um, there is another development that has potential and, and it is part of the government strategy, financial inclusion strategy. Uh, and it's the creation of uh, the, uh, the initiative of the government of creating a deposit account in Banco de la Nación associated to the national identity uh, document of each uh, adult individual in Peru. Uh, this is just starting and it, the initiative came as a result of the difficult, huge difficulties that the government had during the pandemic to uh, distribute the subsidies and bonuses that they wanted to distribute to alleviate the impact of the pandemic. 
in faraway places in people who were un unbanked and not included in the financial system. Uh, this this uh, initiative of, of, of deposit accounts that will be linked to electronic payment systems uh, or wallets, uh, I think it is a huge initiative. It is, it is going to be in place uh, gradually. It's starting right now in October. Uh, it, it is programmed to have 2 million users by, by December or 2 million accounts by December. Uh, but again, uh, the national inclusion strategy has to be working with efforts that work in all different areas, uh, infrastructure, telecommunications, financial educations, all of this uh, to allow people to have confidence in the financial system, to feel safe in the financial system. So it is, it is a huge challenge for, for, for an emerging country like, like us. And I am sure that other Latin American countries are facing similar problems uh, in terms of uh, uh, devising uh, financial inclusion strategies that address all these issues because many of these issues are common to, to the whole region. Thank you, that was very good. Uh, yeah, complicated. Governor uh, in Jorogi, I'm going to go to you. Uh, I'm not going to get you away without talking about the pandemic. You thought this was a pandemic free session, but sorry about that. The pandemic has accelerated digital transformation in the financial sector. So that's a truism. We all become um, digital experts in some ways. You are plugged in many international conversations in Africa and beyond with your peers. So learning from successes and failures when you reflect on that, what needs to be done by policymakers, supervisors in developing countries to harness the promise of digitiz sorry, digitization to achieve better and inclusive recovery now and post pandemic? Thank you. Well, but that's uh, quite a question. And uh, I presume you have like three hours to answer it, but uh, uh, we're compressing it to four minutes. Um, I think uh, you're right. The, during the pandemic, as uh, well, our, our other panelists mentioned, uh, there has been significant transformations. Um, not all of them the right ones, but I think there has been, and I think the digital, do, the, the, um, the benefits uh, from uh, the digital transformation have really been the silver lining in this otherwise dark cloud. But in terms of moving ahead, I think first and foremost, which, which is an element we need to remember. I mean, maybe just to say something about Kenya. Um, during the pandemic, we actually had, uh, we cut back quite a bit on uh, transactions that were cash-based, et cetera. And indeed, not just the cash-based, but also the brick and mortar transform, um, transactions. And now actually banks, 96% of the transactions that banks are, take, uh, are having, they are taking place on the digital platforms. Um, so that is quite a change. And uh, sure, that means a contraction in the sort of demand for brick and mortar, but it is actually a challenge to banks to change their model. Um, let's be clear, it doesn't mean it's the end of brick and mortar. When ATMs were invented, and put all over, uh, people thought that that would be the end of bank tellers. Actually, it didn't happen that way. Um, the banks transformed themselves into something else and really became closer, et cetera. So that is one point I wanted to make. But in terms of the things that we need to take care of, I would say or the lessons from this, I think the first is to remind ourselves, as was mentioned a moment ago, there's still a lot of people that are uh, unbanked that are in the fringes that are financially excluded, 1.7 billion worldwide. And I think from our perspective, we need to watch that gap. Um, I, I think we can get very excited about the top end of uh, people, you know, the elite, people that are going for the, you know, interesting fancy products, but uh, we need to watch that. And I think that's an obligation we as uh, policymakers have to, um, uh, to deal with uh, or to keep in mind all the time. A second element which I think is important, uh, 
related to this is actually um, a lot of these people are not uh, included because they lack formal identifications, so formal IDs. And that is something I think uh, Sukuro um, doubled into that. Um, but I think the point here is that, yes, that is not something we as bankers will do, but we have to push the, the relevant uh, arms of government to deal with those things, um, meaning formal identification. Of course, then of course, the issue of connectivity, you know, having connectivity in the various places, um, pushing the various uh, communication channels out there. Um, that is the second item that I would uh, insist on. And this is, has been a lesson for us during, well, it was a lesson before, but it was underscored during the pandemic is the issue of protecting data. Um, I mentioned it as we were at the, uh, uh, before, but I think the point here is that uh, um, it is important that the, the companies that are responsible for the data are, are actually responsible in that way. So they do not misuse the data. We have had, for instance, some of uh, problems with the digital lenders and they are misusing data. Um, for instance, data that is on your phone, uh, your contacts and using that to in effect um, have rather aggressive debt collection uh, mechanisms, which obviously are, in our view, unethical. But uh, the issue of protecting data is essential. Consumers cannot, uh, or citizens, they should not feel, uh, they should not uh, have to worry about their data being stolen or being misused, etc. And then finally, the, the, the business of, uh, and again, I go back to a point I made earlier, this thing of being people-centric. You know, instead of being technocentric, we should really be more people centric. Um, I was part, as you know, Baba, of a task force of the United Nations Secretary General um, on digital finance and what to do in the context of the SDGs, accelerating uh, achievement of the SDGs. And in the end, the report we wrote um, had this title, you know, People's Money, um, meaning we have to come back to people. What is it that they need? And we deliver that. I mean, at the end of the day, money is a medium um, of exchange and also other things store value, but there is something else. It's not the money that really matters to us. There's something else that is more important. So those are the points I'd want to, to put to you. Um, again, finishing with this item that people are at the center. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. I couldn't, uh, we couldn't agree more with you. People are at the center and that's why the SDGs matter in everything that we do while we keep our eyes uh, vigilantly on the, you know, the levers of the financial activity. You talked about uh, a couple of key inter inter um, infrastructural issues. I'd like to talk about them, you know, lack of formal IDs, connectivity, but also you talked about important values, protecting data, and people putting people at first. So thanks for that perspective. I'd like to turn to Eshwar. Um, you've had a chance to think and reflect about what they have said. From your vantage point, uh, does this digital transformation mean that we are seeing the end of cash? Are there any blind spot implications that uh, we may be missing? Thank you. So thank you, Babak. Um... Virtually every central bank that is um, uh, conducting trials with or has issued um, a CBDC seems to view CBDC as coexisting with cash, which is physical currency. But I think the reality is that businesses and consumers get used to um, the benefits of low cost digital payments. And as these become widely available and accessible, I think cash will organically wither away. I mean, I still love cash. The tactile element of cash is certainly wonderful. It creates a personal uh, connection in transactions, but I think the reality is that it is not as convenient a medium of exchange as um, uh, digital money. One point that Governor Roll made is actually very important to keep in mind here. 
uh, digital uh, money does have many um, possibilities that cash does not have. One can think about, and these have been discussed uh, um, even in the US, the notion of having certain units of digital money with expiry dates, um, the fact that uh, central bank digital currency accounts can make it possible to have negative interest rates. And certainly it's good to have all of these in the monetary policy toolkit during particularly desperate economic circumstances. And we've certainly lived through some of those in the last decade and a half. But each of these um, possibilities opens up questions about whether the faith in central bank issued currencies is going to be maintained at the same level. And that I think is something that needs to be thought through very carefully um, in addition to privacy considerations before uh, we dispense with cash uh, altogether. Now, one of the themes that um, um, Governor Njiroge, Governor Roll, and uh, Ms. Hazen have all touched upon is really about the correct or appropriate role of the government in all of this. Um, governments can and should do a lot to ensure financial stability, to ensure the welfare of the people. Um, as uh, Patrick correctly said, ultimately, this is about uh, the man on the street and his or her welfare. Uh, but of course, the governments cannot do all the innovation that is necessary. What is essential is to provide enough space for the private sector to conduct and undertake this innovation in a safe way. And certainly, many of the dramatic changes we are seeing are coming thanks to private sector innovation. So I draw your attention to how some of these issues have come up and are being resolved in the context of two major economies, um, China and India. In both of these, digital payments are very fast displacing cash, but these two countries have taken a very different approach. In China, um, there was a sort of um, uh, regulatory void that was filled in by private payment providers who provide excellent low-cost digital payment services, but now you have two companies, Alipay and WeChat Pay, that dominate the digital payment space, and this has created a lot of concerns about the lack of entry uh, by new payment providers and, as uh, um, Governor Njiroge pointed out, uh, concerns about how these companies might be using the data that they collect from their massive customer base um, and massive user base um, for commercial purposes. And this is one of the reasons why the Chinese Central Bank um, is thinking of issuing um, the digital version of the Yuan, um, largely so that you have central bank money being relevant at the retail level, but also so that one can ensure some degree of competition in the payment space. India has taken an approach that I think is going to be a template for many other countries to follow. Um, and there are three rails to what is called the India stack, the first is the biometric identification scheme that provides a form of electronic identity to, a, uh, to all of the population, including people in rural areas, people who um, are illiterate and so on. So it provides a mechanism for bringing people into the financial net. And then the government provides the infrastructure for the payment trail. That is to say, it's provided um, uh, the unified payment interface, which essentially is a uh, platform that private payment providers have access to uh, with no party being privileged here, where you have the interoperability issues that Governor Roll um, uh, talked about uh, being dealt with, uh, but you have relatively easy and ent uh, easy entry um, of new payment providers and they can build innovations on top of this infrastructure. So the government does not provide the actual payment services, but sets up the infrastructure. And the third issue is the data rail, um, picking up on what Governor Njiroge said, this is a crucial element um, of the overall um, financial ecosystem that is developing in India. And the government is setting up a process whereby it will introduce legislation that makes people who provide the data and whose data is being used own the data and decide how it can be used. Because data is power at some level and you want people to be able to use the data. So there are going to be account aggregators who will build up uh, a database, but it is ultimately users, uh, consumers, who own the data and decide how it can be used. So I think the government can play a very constructive role in making sure that some of these safeguards in terms of financial stability data protection, investor protection can all be managed without necessarily stifling payment innovation or other types of innovation in the um, uh, emerging financial system. So there is a middle ground and I hope that we will see this developing because ultimately, I think that is the way we can both ensure financial benefits to large parts of the population, but also ensure that we don't create new and unknown risks. Uh, Ishwar, that was actually very interesting. Thank you so much. I was not aware of the India stack, but sounds like they were 
sector trying to address some of the very same issues and barriers that Governor and Jiroge outlined in terms of the infrastructure and integrity of data. And as we're all talking about this is very, uh, it brings an interesting example to my mind. In the early stages of the pandemic, every country was trying to figure out how to, how to provide some financial support to their citizens to the extent that they could afford, right? And there's a case of one country, I'm not gonna name, but you probably know that because of, because their digital, um, uh, infrastructure was so undeveloped, they actually had to send the military to take cash, stacks of cash to people in various areas, rural areas, in the suburbs, in the, in the barrios, in the ghettos, wherever it was that they were taking the money. And you can just see the mess that that can create, the scope for corruption, the scope for all kinds of abuse, and the desperation of the decision makers. So in a sense, the challenges that we're all talking about are very appropriate in the time and age that we are in. So thank you. Uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, I think uh, Governor and Joroge, maybe I'll pose this to you and Socorro, you can also reflect on it. The, <clears throat> this is from our uh, Courageous Anonymous uh, questionnaire. The crypto world is beginning to connect to the traditional financial system fast and players are largely in the unregulated space. How can supervisors and regulators address this question? It's actually a very good question. I mean, I'm surprised the person didn't want to reveal their identity. We would have given him a gold star. Governor. Thank you. I'll be quick and uh, leave the hard uh, part to Socorro, I think. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the way we see it is as follows. The, it's true that crypto, the crypto sort of um, products, let's just call them that, currencies and other products, um, they, they are growing in a rather unregulated fashion. And, uh, and I think we in the sort of uh, regulated world, um, there is a perimeter that, that we, we understand and know. And you can say all that is happening pretty much outside that perimeter. So I think there's a tension. We have to understand that. But the tension needs to be resolved by understanding maybe a couple of things. First and foremost is appreciating the, the issue of whatever we do, we cannot compromise. There are certain things that we cannot compromise, one of which is financial stability. And indeed also other things like, uh, let's say um, price stability, which however you, uh, you define that, et cetera. So I think that is important. So if there's any connection that takes place, um, it has to be, uh, while respecting um, that particular uh, uh, item or that particular requirement. Secondly, uh, the crypto world, I think at this moment, and uh, here I look more to Esperon, um, he's much more embedded in there than we are. Um, but I think the, this is happening more at the higher level of what you may call the, the hierarchy of financial needs. Um, there's less of the crypto lower in the financial needs hierarchy, payments, insurance, et cetera. But it is when you go up to sort of wealth management and things like that, that's why you have a lot of the crypto things. And in some sense, you could say that cryptos could very well be um, just like any other speculative product, you know, asset that you invest in. So I, I think for us, if you look at it that way, the difference is just the promoters. The promoters, of course, um, will say that a particular product, you know, solves all sorts of problems. Um, and, and I think this is how Bitcoin started. You know, it was being pushed for, you know, to be the next best thing in terms of payments and, and so forth. But as Esso mentioned, that is no longer uh, the, the key element. But there are many more interesting technically interesting products you know, that have come out and, uh, and not just uh, the coins, but even other, well, let's say crypto products. So I would say that uh, there'll always be that tension. Regulators will always know what they are and they will remain focused on, uh, on uh, their objectives. So holding the, you know, the tiller really and making sure that, or the steering, making sure that we don't crash. But at the same time, there'll always be those pressures and they'll be, um, yeah, they'll, they'll have to be resolved by ensuring that we understand uh, who is the regulator. Um, just to finish, 
it is important to note that those, um, let's say the, the wealth products that, uh, you know, crypto or otherwise, they are regulators of that. Maybe they are not central bankers, but it's, you do have uh, regulators, the SEC um, and others, but they are not really uh, the central bank. They are not the sort of products that you could say central banks will regulate. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Socorro. Well, thanks for posing this question. <laughs> uh, well, um, yeah, uh, this is one of the unsettled issues. You know, uh, cryptocurrencies uh, pose concerns from several standpoints for regulators, from the financial stability standpoint, from the consumer protection standpoint, from the anti-money laundering standpoint. So, and all of these have to be addressed appropriately. And, and uh, at this stage, we are in, in still in, in the thinking process of, of many of these aspects uh, in, in, in Peru. What we have done so far is really very little, and we are uh, looking forward to defining policies in, in the next uh, few months or year, a couple of years. Uh, at, at, at the first, uh, I can mention two things that we have already done. Uh, first, uh, any uh, lenders, foreign exchange or payments uh, have to be registered in Peru. It doesn't matter if they are, they deal with uh, regular currencies, cryptocurrencies, or they deal with brick, uh, brick and mortar, or they are purely digital, but they, are, they all have to be registered. Um, these are unsupervised, but they need to be registered. And, and the register uh, has one single purpose at this stage, which is to have them a, a basic report to the financial intelligence unit in terms of uh, uh, suspicious transactions and things like that. That is a very, very basic level of, of uh, dealing with this issue. The other thing that we do is, uh, as in, in most countries, we do have informality laws, which means that to do certain things, you have to be either uh, licensed, supervised, or registered. And if you are none of those three and are carrying out uh, activities that require either a license or, or a registry, uh, what we do as a regulator is to issue press releases to alert people that these people are uh, operating in this particular business without following the proper channels. Uh, I know it's very little, and I, but, but this is what we have done so far. Uh, there are several, several issues that, that need to be considered looking forward. Uh, how, to, how to deal with cross-boundary, cross-jurisdictional cr I mean, cross issues. Uh, um, as, 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 of, as of today, it is not an important issue in Peru locally. Uh, cryptocurrencies are not yet important, but they may become important and they are growing. So we do have a concern. We do have something to talk about with Central Bank, Ministry of Finance and other authorities in, in, in this regard. Uh, I'm sorry not to have too many answers at this stage, uh, but uh, it's one of the unsettled, thing, the unsettled ones. Well, those are always the most interesting ones. Thank you so much, uh, Socorro. Governor Roll, uh, as I'm reflecting on these, Issues. I want to come back to one of the things that you said early on that uh, struck me as a very important, I guess, North Star, if you will, which is, uh, you know, on the one hand, as a as a responsible central bank as banker, you are trying to create a space for these innovations, and you're taking the lead, making it possible, making it legitimate. On the other hand, you don't want it to get out of control. You want there to be your control there, like. In some countries, Canada, Australia, I guess being two examples I can think of, financial stability, they really take it to the extreme, to the point that in terms of consumer choice, we don't have as much or not as much as other countries have, and we're always late and laggard. How do you balance these things yourself as you're thinking about this? You talked about the archipelago and all that, but are you, have you struck that balance already? Well, on the, on the financial stability issues, 
and, and monetary policy, we, we, we know that some of the, the, the pressures are probably, if they, are, if they insert themselves, they're more medium range. But we've, we, we, we've initially established limits or parameters around how much uh, CBDC individuals can hold. We, we've also made it very clear as we, we've done for payment products on the whole that it's a fiduciary relationship between the provider and, and the wallet holder. And so they are not to be treated as deposits, which means that there is there's no, no intention that those who receive those types of funds can, can use interest rates or other promises of return to attract funds. And they also cannot uh, deploy them in means that um, would put them at risk so that when the individuals decide to make spending, they're illiquid. So we focus on ensuring that the providers always satisfy the, the full liquidity that's necessary if these are payments, and that they, they are not a deposit bearing, interest bearing deposit type of, of instrument, because it, it also uh, removes the central bank away from being potentially in the position of having to decide what to do from an intermediation point of view if you start to get an accumulation of, of financial resources in, in, in mobile wallets. The, the other thing I know that has come out around financial stability is how fast money can move in this space. And I think, I think technology is likely to prefer provide advantages to regulators if ever there is a need to intervene, if money start to quickly withdraw from one part of the system to the other. But it's important to recognize that it's not necessarily a mobile money issue or a central bank digital currency issue, but more a product of the fact that payments are moving faster and settling instantly, more so in today's financial sector setting and that is really the focus that all uh, of those who are charged with financial stability will still have to reckon with. Thank you. And uh, Ishwar, I'm going to come to you as our, uh, I guess, the very last comment here. And I see a question flashing on non-bank financial institutions. Is there uh, any other thoughts you have for regulators and supervisors about how to get ready or how to be proactive in the, in, you know, so that they're they're not losing control on the innovations that are taking place. And you have literally one minute, so this is a CNN style answer. Thank you. Thanks, Mavak. The last, uh, the title of the last chapter of my book says it all: a glorious future beckons. Perhaps um, I think there is a lot that can be gained from the new technologies, and particularly. Uh, for vulnerable people, um, uh, small scale businesses and so on, especially in developing countries. But I think there is a very important role that governments are going to have to play in so that uh, rules of the game, both at the domestic level, but also at the international level, make sure that the vulnerable people, um, especially low income households in developing countries, but also vulnerable countries um, are not disadvantaged rather than advantaged by all the changes that are coming around us. Great, thank you very much. And you know, I have to give this uh, panel an A. We just finished, we gave the audience one extra minute so they can do whatever they want with their time. You did uh, excellent. Uh, it was a really good kick-ass discussion. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful weekend. Patrick, it's time for you to have a drink. The rest of us still load up on coffee, I think. And then um, let's carry on. And Sokor, I think we're still at coffee's month. And have a great meeting at the World Bank IMF. Namaste, goodbye, everyone.